All right, there we go. And happy Friday morning. And what a way to kick off our FOMA convention, but to talk about bioidentical hormones, exciting. My name is Diane Brzezinski and I am a board certified internist practicing in Naples, Florida. I relocated down here from the Metro Detroit area back in 1999 and started a private practice. And thankfully I have been able to manage to remain solo for all these years. And we will see what happens in the next upcoming years. Anyway, I'm very thankful that FOMA asked me to talk to you today about bioidentical hormones. There's so many misnomers and so much misinformation out there about bioidentical hormones that can be really life-changing for women. So we're gonna talk about bioidentical hormones today and how they affect our health as men and women. And what a better case study to bring up to you, and it includes myself as the only case study member. So I went through premature menopause at age 41 or 42, and it was difficult enough being labeled as having the diagnosis of premature ovarian failure, but nevertheless, that was me. I went through many, many years, and actually my whole 40s of being a complete failure on synthetic or prescription hormone replacement therapy. If there was a preparation, I had been on it, trust me, whether it was Prempro or Duovi or whether we were talking about patches or tablets that you insert or cream that you insert into your vagina, I had tried them all. And finally, when I went in for a visit at age 49, I was just prepared to ask her about bioidentical hormones. And she walks into the exam room and a pleasant 60 to 90 minutes late and saying, oh, hi Diane, it's so nice to see you. And I take it that you just don't feel you like yourself. And that's what I had been complaining about throughout my entire forties that I couldn't really put my finger on it but I just never felt like myself. And I had tried every preparation probably known to mankind in the menopausal spectrum of medication. And finally, I asked her, you know, what do you think about maybe the possibility of switching me over to bioidentical hormones? And I got the long story about how all estrogen causes breast cancer. And what a shame that she actually said, and you know something in a couple of years, you're gonna be 10 years since you started hormone replacement therapy and we're gonna to have to stop it all together then anyway. Well, that couldn't have been something that didn't sit with me any worse than it did. So then go one step further, she said, well, you know, did you ever think that maybe your problem isn't really menopause and maybe your problem is that you should take some Prozac? So anybody that knew me through my menopausal years knew that I was absolutely sleep deprived and for probably eight years, I never slept more than two and a half or three hours a night. And I would be up in the morning and my husband would get up in the morning and say, dear God, I cannot believe you're going to go to work. You're going to work all day in your office for 10 to 12 hours and you're sleeping two and a half to three hours a night. Well, this was so repetitious over eight years. And I think that you just really, you just deal with it. And, you know, what am I supposed to do? I still have to run a practice. And it was what it was. So when she finally had mentioned to me about Prozac and I'm thinking of myself, well, I have sleep deprivation, I have anxiety, I'm already on Wellbutrin, but that doesn't seem to be helping all that much. And now she's recommending Prozac. Maybe that is really what I need to do. So that evening I'm sitting and having dinner with my husband. He said, so how did your appointment go today at the doctor? And I said to him, I said, well, you have to understand. 
It was almost like telling her my whole life story for the eighth or ninth time and just telling her that I really just don't feel like myself. And her suggestion was that perhaps I need to add Prozac to my regimen. And I'm just going to tell all of you men and women out there who are treating postmenopausal women with anxiety, depression, uh, social phobias, panic disorder, sleep disorder, please don't think that prescribing them Prozac is going to make one bit of difference in the way that they feel. Because I finally said to my husband, I'm not sure that Prozac will really help what is happening with me. And he looked at me and he said, Diane, you never had these problems until you entered into menopause. So do you think that perhaps these things are all hormonally related? So I had been thinking about learning everything that there was to learn about bioidentical hormones for the previous few years or so. And that was finally my red flag to say, darn it, I'm going to learn everything that there is to learn about bioidentical hormones. I looked it up, I researched it, I contacted companies, I researched uh, people who teach about bioidentical hormones, and I ended up landing with this fabulous physician in Houston. And I was flying out to see him and shadow with him on Fridays. And I spent several Fridays with him with many different disciplines that I was learning about, not only bioidentical hormones, so we were seeing women at his clinic that day who were being treated with bioidentical hormones. And I was listening to their story from start to finish and where they were actually today in light of being treated with bioidentical hormones. We took a little break for lunch and I finally felt comfortable enough to talk to him about my whole story. And I said, you know, these women that we're talking about, they sound just like me. And he looks at me and he says, Diane, are you menopausal? And at that point, I was 49 years old. And I said, yes, I've been menopausal since I was 41, 42. Oh, so tell me about the preparations that you've been prescribed. And I went down the whole long list of all of the prescriptions that I had tried over the last at least eight or nine years for hormone replacement therapy. And he just kind of shook his head and he said, now you know what we've been talking about in clinic. We have the phlebotomist here and why don't we just have him draw your blood and let's see the proofs in the pudding. Let's see what your hormonal levels really look like. What did I have to lose, right? I was there to learn everything that I could learn about bioidentical hormones. So I let them draw my blood. He said, you know, you're going to be here in two weeks so we can sit down and talk about all of your blood work and how it relates to bioidentical hormones. Okay, it was agreeable with that. So they draw my blood and five days later, I get an email from him. It doesn't say anything except now you know why you feel the way you do. And attached was all of my blood work. So here I am scrolling through all of this blood work, being a better educated person, how to really talk and evaluate a, a postmenopausal woman. So first and foremost, my TPL, my thyroid antibodies were 794, meaning that I do have Hashimoto's thyroiditis. That, that was just the first thing that I saw on the list. Then I saw that I had no measurable estrogen whatsoever. I was swallowing it orally. My FSH level was 92. So clearly my menopausal symptoms were not being controlled with what I was swallowing orally. And lastly, my testosterone level was not detectable. This is really interesting because we're going to talk about this as the lecture goes on. So now you can understand where I was when I started this journey with bioidentical hormones and why I'm so passionate about these little hormones in my private practice 
because I've been listening to women for all these years talking about not just lack of libido or vaginal dryness, but how about I'm anxious, I'm depressed, I have social phobias that I've never had before ever. I'm sweating during the day, I'm sweating during the night. I could care less whether I ever had intercourse with my partner ever again in my lifetime. And I can't remember what I'm doing from day to day, that menopausal brain frog fog that I never realized that I even had until my menopausal numbers were corrected. So this was really interesting because not only was it a passion because I was seeking out something to try to help me with my own symptoms, but how it's totally transformed my practice into a big bioidentical hormone replacement therapy practice in little old Naples, Florida. So here we go. You got to strip on your seatbelts because we're going to fly through some of this stuff pretty quickly. We already know about hormones and what they do and what they don't do and lab values and all of that. So I'm not going to really go back to hormones 101, but I'm going to try to take off with where we started or the lack of starting with bioidentical hormone replacement therapy from this next slide. Here we go. Doesn't all hormone replacement therapy increase your risk of breast cancer? Many of you are probably shaking your head and saying, yep, it does. And if a woman uses hormone replacement therapy for long enough, she's bound to determine to develop breast cancer. Well, stay tuned because maybe I'm about to change your mind. So there have been a couple of studies out um, about reducing the incidence of breast cancer in women that have been treated with testosterone or testosterone with anastrozole. And this was one of the first studies, and it was a large study that was released in 2019. And it was a 10 year cohort study by Rebecca Glazer. She's in Ohio and has been really the, uh, on the forefront of really trying to identify that women are at no increased risk of, of developing invasive breast cancer using bioidentical therapy. So her study included 1,267 women, um, either using testosterone or testosterone with anastrozole. And her study concluded that there really was no increased risk of invasive breast cancer at all. In fact, the incidence was only 165 uh, women out of 100,000. We'll expound on that a little bit further going forward. So testosterone therapy has been really increasing and increasing 12-fold worldwide since the year 2000. So there's a current study that was just uh, released, and it was a retrospective observational study that was specifically designed to investigate the incidence of breast cancer in women with subcutaneous testosterone and or testosterone plus estradiol for the clinical syndrome of testosterone deficiency and or menopausal state. So this just didn't look at testosterone, but it was looking at testosterone plus estradiol. And please keep in mind that this was subcutaneous testosterone or testosterone plus estradiol. So one of the things that we're gonna talk about later in this lecture is why you should not swallow hormone replacement therapy orally. So in the study that I've included, you can read through all of this, but like I said, this is a brand new study that was just released. And in um, 2010, they started a study, 2,377 women were enrolled. They were pre and postmenopausal women and they were treated with testosterone or testosterone combined with estradiol. The, the total cases divided by the total sample size in years in the study was expressed as incidence per 100,000 person years. And it was uh, compared with the SERV incidence rates. 
So what they found in the study was that testosterone and or testosterone implants or uh, transdermal testosterone and estradiol significantly reduced the incidence of breast cancer in pre and menopausal women. So wait a second, weren't we always taught that all estrogen causes breast cancer? So this may be the start of a new revolution that perhaps it is not related to estradiol. And the addition of estradiol did not increase the incidence over using testosterone alone. A marked reduction in invasive breast cancer cases was found compared to the age match SEER expected number of invasive breast cancer cases. We only had 14 in the study versus 48 in the SEER's match study. And remember that, that World uh, or Women's Health Initiative study that was uh, released back in the early 2000s? Do you know that 71 women in that placebo group uh, developed breast cancer? So now we're looking at 14 cases versus 48 cases in the SEER expected number and 71 cases in the placebo arm of the World Women's Health Initiative study. This equates to 144 women in 100,000 versus 223 in 100,000 for the SEER data. This is the second multi-year long-term study demonstrating the benefit of testosterone therapy in reducing the incidence of invas invasive breast cancer. So what are bioidentical hormones, you ask? Well, bioidentical hormones are structurally identical to the hormones that are made by our body. So if you think about a deadbolt lock and you think about sticking in a key to open the lock, bioidentical hormones, when you turn the, uh, the lock, when you insert the key of bioidentical hormones, the lock is gonna open. When you talk about synthetic hormones, let's say synthetic estrogen or synthetic testosterone, you're gonna insert that key into that deadbolt lock, but guess what? It isn't gonna turn. And why is that? Because it doesn't mimic our own natural hormone production. Therefore, it needs to go undergo all of these transformational changes before that deadbolt will open. And you'll see, those transformational changes are the ones that lead to increased risk of developing certain things with using synthetic hormones. So when we look at bioidentical hormone, estradiol or E2 is the most biologically active estrogen. Remember, we've got estriol and we've got uh, estrone as well. Estradiol is made from soy or yams, which is interesting because in certain preparations, of bioidentical hormones that you use, you can take a woman that has a soy allergy and you can still use implantable estradiol hormone replacement therapy in her in the bioidentical route because it isn't gonna make one bit of difference whether she has an allergy from soy. She can tolerate uh, the implants for estradiol. So remember, we're looking for 17 beta estradiol supplements such as Estrace, Climera, Vivel, Minivel, Estragel, or Estring. So here's the comparison between the bioidentical and synthetic. And we already talked about this here, that the bioidentical are really created from soy or yams. So they're plant-derived and that we know that estradiol or E2 is the most biologically active estrogen, and there's the preparations that we are most familiar with. So when we talk about synthetic hormone replacement therapy made from animal parts or urine, <laughs> and here are the uh, examples of those, which I've taken every one of those on the list, with the, exam, with the exception of Premarin, uh, because I do need progesterone, so I was taking the combination. Um, 
it kind of grossed me out to realize that every single preparation that I was taking was made from animal parts or urine. But nevertheless, that's what a synthetic hormone is, or we can choose the bioidentical route, which is the plant-derived route uh, made from soy or yams. So when we look back, way back when, why did we use testosterone years and years ago? So this was really interesting to, to find this information that back in 1942, testosterone was used for the prevention of peripheral vascular disease. Yep, that is true. And in 1953, it was used to treat angina in both males and females in which there was a reported 91% improvement in their symptoms. And this goes clear back to the New England Journal of Medicine in 1942 and 1953. So that's how long we've been using testosterone therapy, but we were never really recording why we use it in females. So here's the top 10 myths about testosterone in women. Well, of course, testosterone is a male hormone. Well, yeah, that is true, but we also have an overabundance of it in females as well. Testosterone's only role in women is sex drive and libido. Well, that can't be further from the truth. Yes, it helps some of those things, but it is more beneficial than just sex drive and libido. Testosterone masculinizes a woman. I tell all my patients, uh, female patients that is, that I use testosterone, that I don't have one female patient in my practice that is shaving a mustache or a beard. Um, testosterone causes hoarseness and voice changes. No, that's not uh, bioidentical testosterone. Maybe if we were using anabolic steroids or anabolic testosterone, we could, we could lump it into that category, but not the nice bioidentical testosterone. This is a big one too. Testosterone in females causes hair loss. Well, contrary to popular belief, um, two thirds of all women over the age of 40 will naturally start thinning their hair at some point in their life. There's only about 2% of women that really do lose hair uh, from optimizing testosterone and uh, is very rare. And there are some really, really incredible natural treatments for this to help them keep their hair. But nevertheless, more than likely, it is never related to thyroid function, hormonal imbalance, or anything of that nature. Because as I said, two thirds of all women will naturally thin their hair after the age of 40. So here's some more, I love these. Testosterone has an adverse effect on the heart. That couldn't even be more further from the truth. And in fact, there are studies out now with bioidentical testosterone that show that it's pretty important that we try to use these in people who have congestive heart failure, because we think that it might really improve the squeezing and contractility of the heart muscle. So in conjunction with all of the other medications that we use for, for congestive heart failure, it may actually help pre um, preserve or improve ejection fracture. Um, testosterone causes liver damage. No, that's not the case. Uh, anabolic testosterone can go on to uh, cause people to develop hepatocellular carcinoma, but not bioidentical testosterone. Testosterone causes aggression. Same thing, not bioidentical testosterone. Synthetic testosterone does cause aggression and I have seen it, trust me. I have some men in my practice who are coming to see me um, because they're trying to get off of testosterone cyprianate because the, uh, the spouse is telling them that they're just a little bit overly aggressive at home. And it's really interesting that we can use bioidentical or plant-derived -derived tes testosterone in some of these men. And it's interesting, we can get them to higher levels of testosterone than we could with the injectable or synthetic testosterone and they are cool as a cucumber. 
Testosterone may increase the risk of breast cancer. Well, we have two big studies out now that disprove that. And also the safety of testosterone use in women has not been established. Well, yes, it has. And it's clear back into the um, 1950s. And now this has been really, really reported um, since 2013. So here we go, women age 20 to 40 lose 50% of their testosterone production. This always cracks me up because I think of these poor young women that are in their 30s. And let's say they've got um, three young children at home and they're a housewife. They, they have three full-time jobs at home, taking care of these kids, grocery shopping, cleaning the house, making dinner every night, making sure that their husband is happy when he gets home from work. And she'll go in to see her doctor and say, listen, I am just exhausted. I'm at the end of my rope and I could care less with these three kids whether I ever had sex with my husband ever again. And what does that doctor tell that poor young woman? Oh, you know, you're just busy. You've got three children at home. You're trying to keep up a household. And, you know, what did you expect? This is what all these women go through that are your age with multiple children at home. Well, how about if it maybe doesn't have everything related to that? But how about if it has to do with these women that have already lost 50% of their testosterone production? That's a very interesting point that I think that you guys should all ponder later on after this talk. And now we talk about men. So men do lose one to 3% of their total testosterone production per year, starting at the age of 30. Um, but more importantly, there's a significant change in that balance of albumin and sex hormone binding globulin. So remember that SHBG increases the albumin bound testosterone decreases. So you've got the sex hormone binding globulin that goes up and you've got the albumin bound testosterone that decreases. And remember, that's the form of testosterone that we utilize. Um, so testosterone, believe it or not, does have positive effect, uh, effects on uh, lipids. It does improve body composition, but does not turn you into Popeye. Um, you will have increased exercise capacity and improvement in bone min mineral density. And actually, they've been able to prove that women with osteoporosis that use subcutaneous bioidentical testosterone actually can have an 8.3% increase in their bone density each year. And I'll tell you, this is the real deal because I was so leery about treating osteoporotic women like this when I was starting to use bioidentical testosterone. But I had several women in my practice that just said, there is no way that I'm going to give myself a daily injection to counteract the osteoporosis that I have. And I finally just said, listen, if there's nothing that I can talk you into, how about if we try bioidentical testosterone? And I had, boy, probably two handfuls of women that um, I was following for the period of two years with using bioidentical testosterone. And I have to tell you, I about just wanted to cry the very first time that we did a bone density test on these women two years after. And I started thinking to myself, I think I'm seeing better increases in bone density with these women that are doing bioidentical uh, testosterone than women who are injecting Forteo or Timlos or doing the Prolia every six months. I've been very, very impressed. And out of those women that I still continue to follow, I have still yet to see a hip fracture in any of those women. So 
always keep that in the back of your mind for women who don't want to use injectables for osteoporosis treatment, that there are other treatment options for them. We also know that testosterone improves insulin resistance and can reduce the um, incidence of coronary artery disease. And I'll just let you know that um, there's a year long clinical trial that's happening right now. And I do have uh, some patients that are enrolled in that clinical trial. And there are 1500 people nationwide enrolled in this trial. And it actually is just going after cardiometabolic factors. So we're uh, checking cholesterol levels, um, fasting insulin levels, C-reactive protein, homocysteine, things of that nature. And uh, sometime in December or January, we will be concluding this year-long clinical trial of the 1,500 patients that are in it. And stay tuned that we're going to talk about the improvement that hormone replacement therapy in the bioidentical route has on cardiometabolic factors. It's something that's really interesting that's going to hit the, uh, hit the books uh, next year. So here we go. Everybody always asks me this, listen, um, I don't want to use testosterone because I'm afraid that I'm going to develop prostate cancer. There's um, several urologists um, nationwide who do use uh, testosterone, namely bioidentical testosterone on men that do have prostate cancer. And what we have found is that it really does not adversely affect prostatatic uh, intraepithelial neoplasia or PIN, and it doesn't really increase the man's risk of developing prostate cancer. It has no significant effect on PSA at all. And actually, um, what I have seen in my practice is that it, it normally does not increase PSA levels at all. And I think probably the most I've ever seen in a rise of a PSA in a man who's using the bioidentical testosterone is a 0 0.5 uh, increase in a year, which is really negligible. And actually, there are some things out there that show that men who use bioidentical testosterone, let's say it's just in their cards that at some point in time, they're going to develop prostate cancer. Some think that the prostate cancer that they develop will be a far lesser aggressive form of prostate cancer. And that after one year of treatment, let's say it's um, uh, radiation therapy and their PSA remains uh, undetectable, you can safely use bioidentical testosterone in these men without having to worry too much about increasing their risk of recurrence. Um, I do have a handful of men that have had a Gleason 6 or Gleason 7. I think I have one with a Gleason H uh, prostate cancer who is currently using bioidentical testosterone. And so far, so good. So here was a prostate cancer study that was done. This was published in the Journal of Urology in 2013. Granted, it was only, um, whoops, I'm sorry about that. 103 males uh, that were, were looked at, um, but they were men with prostate cancer and they were radical prostatectomy patients. In a 27 month follow up, 26 patients with a high risk Gleason score of 0 0.8, uh, there was only a 4% recurrence in testosterone treated group, but there was a 16% recurrence in the untreated or the placebo group. So we aren't able to show in small studies so far that bioidentical testosterone increases the risk of recurrence of prostate cancer. Oh, something that I should go back to in the studies where we were looking at testosterone um, with the increased incidence of breast cancer, which we were able to show that there was no increased risk of the development of breast cancer. I want to tell you that these studies that were done, we, or they, I shouldn't say we, it wasn't part of the clinical trials, but they did not cherry pick the patients that they put into these clinical trials. And actually 
The second study that I told you about, they actually found that 28% of the women um, that were in this large cohort study um, had a family history of breast cancer. So these weren't women that had a low risk of developing breast cancer in their lifetime. These were real life women that have an elevated risk of developing breast cancer in their lifetime from any reason, whether it's being overweight or their smoking history or the family history or what have you. So, you know, they didn't just pick women who are already at a low risk of the development of breast cancer anyway. And these women were followed over 10 years. So those were, those were two pretty good studies. Um, sorry to get off on that tangent. So men with low testosterone, what are they at risk for? Well, Alzheimer's disease, cardiovascular disease, prostate cancer, uh, diabetes. Oh, did you see that prostate cancer, men with low testosterone? Um, diabetes, yep, sarcopenia. They have increased abdominal fat, insulin resistance, a higher C-reactive protein and atherosclerosis. We know that men with low testosterone are at a 41% increase in all-cause mortality. A low testosterone is predictive, predictive of um, uh, developing cardiovascular disease. And this was put out in circulation Back in 2007, and people are still arguing this. So here, this increased abdominal fat, insulin resistance, higher CRP, those are the things that we're uh, really going after with this uh, large study about um, reduction in cardiometabolic uh, factors. So here we go, women with low testosterone, same thing, increased risk for Alzheimer's disease, cardiovascular disease, osteoporotic related fracture, diabetes, and possibly breast cancer. So what are the positive effects of bioidentical testosterone in men? Improved erectile uh, abilities, and that is true. Even when we're talking about um, things that we can use like Cialis, Viagra, um, many of the things that we can use in the alternative uh, medicine world like uh, oxytocin and PT-141, things of that nature, we will all tell you that those things marginally work uh, unless you have a really nice, robust testosterone in men. Um, testosterone actually is very protective to the prostate, uh, cardiovascular protection. We've talked about that earlier. Uh, it may improve uh, lipid profiles, increase energy, feeling of overall well-being. That's the number one thing that I see in my patients, men and women. They don't talk about one specific thing that's better. They tell me that they have an overall sense of feeling fantastic. Um, they can reduce body fat, build muscle mass, reduce anxiety and irritability, and they have cognitive clarity, things that we've talked about earlier today. Here's the positive effects with women. Enhanced libido, it does work. Um, I tell women all the time, if you're not feeling really a, um, uh, an increase in your libido when we're optimizing testosterone, there is one of two problems. Um, either you've got too many things going on in your life that are affecting you, or I'm just really sorry to say it, but perhaps you didn't pick the right partner um, because it really does enhance libido. I can choose to give you bioidentical testosterone, but I can't help you choose the perfect partner. And I tell women that all the time. Um, here we go, heart protection, uh, improvement in lipid profiles, increasing uh, energy, sleep enhancement. Boy, did I need that. In contrary to popular belief, uh, progesterone is a fabulous sleep aid to menopausal women, whether they still have an intact uterus or not. Um, here we go, a feeling of overall well-being, reducing body fat, stronger bones and muscles, uh, depression relief and reducing brain fog. And I'll tell you, the very first time that I was given bioidentical testosterone, my brain fog was gone in the first 
12 days that was pretty amazing. And I didn't even realize that I had it. So here, this was uh, 2016, they came out with a male consensus committee resolution on, the, on um, how we can um, improve a male with using um, testosterone. So here now is the female consens consensus committee resolution. So resolution one, testosterone is not a male exclusive hormone. It is the most abundant gon gonadal hormone throughout a woman's life. Resolution number two, serum testosterone levels do not correlate with symptoms of testosterone deficiency in women. Optimal ranges of serum testosterone levels in women have not been established. Well, yeah, I guess formally they haven't been established, but believe it or not, when we're looking at optimal testosterone levels for a female, we're looking really to get them between a range of 150 and 250. This is funny, I'll tell you this cute little story. I have this cute little old man that comes in, his testosterone level I think was only about 164. And I looked at him and I said, geez, you know, Mr. Smith, 164, certainly we can do way better than that. And he's in his seventies and I'm telling him, you know, maybe we could even get your testosterone level up into the 900 or 1000, 1100 range. He goes, boy, Dr. B, that would be really, really awesome, wouldn't it? And I said, well, I have to tell you that my testosterone level runs around 300. So we have some work to do with you. And he just chuckled and chuckled and chuckled. And I think I'll be his best friend for the remainder of his life. Um, so even though optimal ranges of testosterone haven't been established, we do know that a testosterone level in a female of 30 or 40 or 50 probably is not beneficial for all the medical benefits that they can get from optimizing testosterone. Resolution number three, female testosterone insufficiency is a clinical syndrome that may occur during any decade of adult life. Yep, that is true. And it can start as early as 20s. Uh, resolution number four, testosterone therapy may be breast protective, and I've given you two clinical studies that prove that. Resolution number five, testosterone insufficiency in women negatively affects sexuality. Yeah, it does, as long as they have the right partner. General health and quality of life, testosterone supplementation may positively influence sexuality, general health, and quality of life. So, um, that is true. So here we go. Resolution number six, testosterone insufficiency may be associated with an increased risk of cardiovascular disease in women. Yep, that is true. Resolution number seven, testosterone optimization may be brain protective and may enhance cognitive function. Yes, we know that optimizing testosterone in males and females may reduce their risk of developing short-term memory loss as they continue to celebrate a few more birthdays. Resolution number eight, testosterone optimization may be a key component for improved bone health. Yes, 8.3% improvement in bone density in women each year. Resolution number nine, testosterone therapy in women has no effects on uh, lipids or has no effects on uh, lipids and or cardiovascular risk. That is true. We know that it improves lipid panel. Resolution number 10. You know what? I think that I'm starting to sound like Beer, Bill Maher um, on his show. Um, resolution number 10. Studies of testosterone supplementation show benefits exceed the risk and consent, consistent purity and potency can be achieved. And that is true. All right, so here we go. Here's a little recap. What does testosterone protect? Pr protect brain, heart, bones, and breast. Those are things that are important for you to remember. And this is for males and females. So here are the references that I've given you if you want to go back and look up anything or fact check anything that I've been talking about. Here's some references that I've given you for testosterone. All right, here we go. Here's the bioidentical estradiol, everything that uh, you wish that you wanted to know about estradiol and more, including how it does not increase your risk of developing breast cancer. So here we go. 
Um, oh, here we go. So here we go. We all know these things, and I'll let you review these at your leisure. Um, how do you know when a woman is estrogen deficient? She's not giving a period. And actually, it's interesting. If you look at the ACOG data, they say no menses for a year. Eh, I really look at it. If, if you're really having a regular periods or um, you're only having a period every few months or so, yeah, you probably have estrogen deficiency. High clashes, mood swings, vaginal dryness, poor sleep. Boy, that was a big problem with me. Breast tenderness, uh, headaches or worsening of pre-existing migraines, depression and anxiety, frequent urinary tract infections because we're not really feeding the vaginal wall with estrogen. These are all things associated with estrogen deficiency. So we know that estradiol is cardioprotective and it does decrease the woman's risk of developing type 2 diabetes. Um, only oral estrogen increases the risk of developing uh, venous thrombo uh, embolism. Uh, and that is true. Uh, they have never been able to prove that from using uh, estrogen in a transdermal route, only oral. Uh, no increased risk of breast cancer, even with using micronized progesterone. Remember that you cannot use things like um, uh, Provera or Medrexy progesterone or things of that nature. You really do need to use a micronized progesterone and not a progestin with estradiol. And then you have no increased risk of developing breast cancer. Uh, prevents osteoporosis. I'm not so sure about that. You know, I think that um, osteoporosis, we're going to find out with time, probably is more testosterone deficient related, um, but I don't know, they could prove me wrong. Uh, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, cognitive impairment, reduced risk of mortality, heart failure, and death from an acute MI, and it's neuroprotective. Um, here we go. Here's all the negative side effects of swallowing estrogen orally. Um, breast tenderness, worsens their headaches, that does have an adverse effect on uh, blood pressure. Um, synthetic progestins also do this, not the micronized progesterone. Um, they both ad have an adverse effect on blood pressure. Nausea and or vomiting, fluid retention, certainly DVT or PE, gallstones or gallbladder dysfunction. The, um, the synthetic progestins also do this, but not the micronized progesterone all of the things that you really don't want to create in a woman, right? So hypercoagulable states, we'll talk about this just briefly. Remember, oral but not transdermal estrogen is associated with an increased risk of VTE. The um, uh, norepregnane derivatives may be thrombogenic, whereas micronized progesterone appears to be safe with respect to thrombogenic risk. Transdermal estrogen may improve substantially the benefit risk ratio of hormone replacement therapy. Treatments are a safer option, especially with women who are at risk of venous thromboembolism. So I do have uh, several women in my practice with factor V Leiden deficiency that have already clotted and are on um, oral anticoagulation that I do use bioidentical hormones. They are not excluded from using transdermal or uh, bioidentical hormones in the implant uh, route, only orally. Um, here we talked about relief of symptoms, hot flashes, headaches, insomnia, and you can see, look at that, 81% uh, of the patients had hot flashes and sweats uh, prior to the uh, using of bioidentical hormone replacement therapy, 90.8% had complete relief of their symptoms, zero had no relief. So you can go down this whole long list and you can see exactly, you know, how many percent uh, of these patients had all of these issues, loss of libido, uh, irritability, uh, poor memory and concentration. Certainly these were all insomnia. These were all things that I had as well. And look at the amount of women that had complete relief of their symptoms and really a very small percentage of women that had no relief from their symptoms whatsoever. So, you know, the bottom line here is don't poo poo off women that are complaining of these things because there are good treatment options for them that can really give them a quality of life back. 
Uh, oral estrogen, so here we go, uh, increasing total cortisol by increasing the total CBG levels, therefore transdermal estrogens are being used more and more in clinical practice. Oral estrogen, you guys may not have known this either, uh, increases thyroid binding globulin through an increased rate of TBG being made in the liver. So remember, TBG binds thyroid hormone and reduces the amount of thyroid hormone that's available to the body. So we're not really using um, what we have available and it increases the total T4. I really didn't know this um, about oral estrogen until I really started learning about bioidentical hormones. So keep in mind that these women who maybe are menopausal, but they're also hypothyroid, you probably don't wanna use oral estrogen in them at all, that you really would want to use something that is in the transdermal or the implant world of bioidentical hormones. Um, here we go. So same thing that I just said, it increases thyroid medication requirements. So topical estrogen or implant therapy may be the preferred route of therapy for women who need estrogen and thyroid replacement. Keep in mind this as well. Here, this MMP9 and the oral estrogen is really, really important because remember, this MMP9 uh, pathway that we learned about way back in the day um, um, may be the pathway that increases the length of the development of uh, certain forms of cancer like breast cancer. Um, also, it may uh, increase inflammatory mediators such as C-reactive protein, interleukin-6, MMP9, things of that nature. Um, so bioidentical hormones in general are safer. So in young postmenopausal women, it's a safe and effective tool for counteracting their menopausal symptoms. Uh, prevention of long-term degenerative diseases like osteoporotic fract uh, fractures, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, cognitive impairment, um, non-oral estrogens. There's no increased risk of venous thromboembolism and they have better blood pressure control. Natural progesterone, like micronized progesterone, positive cognitive effects and no increased risk of breast cancer has been in found. Has been found. Transdermal estrogen and natural pro progesterone has significant advantages. And hopefully I've, I've proved that uh, today. I didn't really go a lot into progesterone um, because I, I, I really am just allotted so much time. I could talk for a whole weekend on bioidentical hormones, um, but just always remember that if a woman has a uterus and you're using any kind of bioidentical hormones, please make sure that you're using micronized progesterone to protect that woman's uterus. The other thing is, is one of my, um, you know, my, one of my little hallmark things is, is that even though a woman has had a hysterectomy and she really doesn't need to take progesterone if we're giving her estrogen, if she has a significant sleep impairment, I do give her a really low dose of micronized uh, progesterone because it is the, the world's best sleep agent for a postmenopausal woman. And then I think we're finishing up here. Um, transdermal estrogen, remember, no increased risk of stroke, venous thromboembolism, no adverse cardiovascular effects, no effects on gallbladder function. Um, info is still accurate in patients with diabetes and uh, cardiovascular disease as, as far as reducing the risk of developing those things. Um, oral micronized progesterone are really the uh, superior agents. It does not increase the risk of breast cancer, stroke, or venous thromboembolism. No adverse cardiovascular effects with using oral micronized progesterone. And you can use these things indefinitely. So I'll just leave you with a little parting thought that, um, um, oh, wait, here's my estradiol references if you guys want to really um, look at those things. So um, the take home point for this really is for you to realize that 
especially for me, for females, we're born with hormones for a reason. And why do we have to take them away? Um, if there's a way that we can safely optimize hormonal levels in a female as they continue to progress through their whole life cycle, why wouldn't we do that if there's going to be some great health benefits and uh, that they really feel well and they don't have to worry every time they're going for a mammogram that they're going to have uh, a diagnosis of breast cancer. And also, you know, I look at my own mother who is going to turn 86 years old this year and I do use bioidentical hormones in her and I've been using them for about seven years in her since before, <coughs> excuse me, since before uh, she turned 80. And people ask me this all the time. It's, it's not that I want her snagging some man in Marco Island and having a great rump in the head. I mean, if that's what she chooses to do and maybe the bioidentical hormones make her feel a little frisky, more power to her. I just don't need to know about it. However, you know, her father died of coronary artery disease. Uh, her two sisters and her mother uh, broke uh, bones from osteoporosis. Her poor mother, you know, died at the age of 82 of terrible, terrible uh, dementia. And if those are a few things that I can reduce the risk of my mom developing as she continues to age, then I really think that I'm doing the right thing uh, with her. As long as she's getting her mammograms done every year and she's still feeling well, why wouldn't I continue to give her bioidentical hormones? So I don't want you to be nervous about, oh my gosh, I can only use hormones for so many um, uh, years or things of that nature. And you know what? I'm always available for you guys to discuss this stuff. If there's questions that you have or, or things that pop into your mind, um, I'm readily available. Um, I can give you my office number. Uh, that is area code 239-261-9990. Or just drop me a quick email at drb at drbnaples.com. And I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. So that's it for me for now. I'm glad that I got to start off this FOMA uh, convention with some wonderful topics and some things to really stimulate your mind. And I hope the rest of the weekend goes well for you as well as for me. And I'm going to sign off now. And I think that I'm going to be on live and I'll be happy to take any of your questions.